regarding this type of, of, uh, of an issue. Um, at a very high level, these are some of the, um, uh, the main characteristics or, or, or the way that ransomware behaves. So um, one of the things is that uh, it, it does generally use a fairly high strength encryption. Um, it takes your assets and then holds them hostage, demands payment from your victims for a decryption key. Um, but this is an interesting one. It uses high pressure techniques to get victims to pay. One of the things that we're seeing now is the, um, uh, the use of ransomware to say, uh, look, we found these, these uh, emails to your girlfriend or you know, you know, that your wife doesn't know about, and if you don't let us have our money, we're going to send them to your wife, right? That kind of thing. Or we have these pictures uh, that we'll send to everybody that you have on Facebook, right? So um, they're finding ways to, to leverage human weaknesses and, and human um, uh, fear uh, to, to get their money. Um, they do threaten to erase all your data and, and render your enterprise computers inoperable. Um, the threat vectors that they typically use are drive-by downloads, uh, email, whether it's spam, uh, just kind of general, or spear phishing, um, unpatched internet server and apps. So you guys heard about the, the, the thing that happened down in Atlanta, right, where, where the city of Atlanta got infected by uh, SamSam. And one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting is that during the time that this was actually taking place, uh, where they were in the news every day and, 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 and they had, uh, was it Mandiant and a couple other people come in and they were trying to troubleshoot this. One of the reporters actually did a scan of public facing IP addresses for uh, City of Atlanta um, servers and they found port 445 open to the internet on some of their public servers. While this was still going on, after port 445 had already been exploited and, and, and they were worldwide news, they still had this, this uh, stuff open to the world. So uh, pretty fascinating that uh, humans kind of miss things um, when, when, when the chips are down. Okay, so that was a, a broad picture of ransomware. P uh, not Petya, which was kind of a variation of Petya, uh, was different. Uh, we are seeing more usage of supply chain infections, and I'll talk about uh, how that worked with NotPetya, but uh, uh, that, that was kind of a new twist to it with NotPetya. It used multiple attack techniques, so it did use the Eternal Blue uh, exploit, but it also used some other things that we'll talk about. It was very fast, right? We saw the, the, the timeline there that happened within just a few hours. Um, it was destructive. It destroyed the assets. It didn't... Um, give uh, the, the, the organizations any opportunity to recover. Uh, the, the, the whole intent was just to destroy. Um, it did wipe event logs, which is kind of interesting. Um, if, you're, if your intent is just to, to destroy a system, why bother take the time to, to wipe an event log? Maybe that was just a, a traditional way of, of cleaning up that uh, was just part of the, the attacker's modus operandi, but uh, uh, that was kind of curious. And it was a very targeted attack. So um, let's talk about how it actually happened. So um, the first thing is, is having to do with that supply chain that we were talking about. So um, this isn't like uh, many of the traditional uh, viruses or, or, or attacks that we see where an email was sent to somebody and they clicked on a link. What actually happened here is that um, uh, a, a, a threat actor that may or may not have been, but absolutely positively was Russia, um, wanted to attack Ukraine. So um, rather than trying to penetrate each and every organization within Ukraine and dumping this malware onto to those organizations, what they decided to do was compromise this ME doc financial application. So think of like TurboTax or Quicken. So a lot of organizations that use or, or, or that do business with the government in Ukraine use MEDOC. That's, that's kind of the, the, the tool that they use for their accounting. So the threat actor um, infiltrated the MEDOC financial application. And what was interesting is that MEDOC pushes updates to their clients, right? 
just like many, many, customer, many software vendors do today. So they, they compromised MEDOC, inserted the, um, the, the, the not patch of payload into the next update, and then when the update gets delivered to all their customers, essentially they've used MEDOC as their SMS, right, or SCCM. And they, they pushed it out to all the customers, and then it was activated uh, pretty much simultaneously uh, across all of Ukraine. Oops, no one. So uh, that's how it got installed. Uh, it, it was able to launch some malicious code on the devices. From there, um, it did uh, use the external blue, or the eternal blue exploit. And um, so that was the, the, the way that it initially made uh, the attack. How it got from machine to machine is credential theft. So if, 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 uh, if a user had uh, uh, the, the same credentials uh, from one machine to the other, it just traversed from one machine using those same credentials over and over again. So that was where we were talking about uh, multiple attack vectors. It wasn't just using the Eternal Blue exploit. <clears throat> um, some of the other things that were interesting about it uh, were that uh, what it would do uh, to, to find other machines on the network um, it would look at the, the, the network adapter, figure out what subnet it was on, and understand, okay, I know how many machines roughly are on this subnet. Let me, let me try to reach out to those guys and, uh, and contact them as well. And then it would ex ex execute. Um, it encrypted uh, your master file table, made the system completely unbootable, uh, fairly useless. Uh, cleared the Windows event logs, and the question is, you know, what other things did it do before it just made the systems completely inoperable. So uh, it was a very destructive attack, uh, very sophisticated, well, I wouldn't say very sophisticated, but, but, but it was very coordinated um, in the way that they uh, uh, made this attack happen. So from Microsoft's perspective, uh, some of the things that, that we saw that, that, that we took note of, um, the NotPetya attack was less widespread than WannaCry, um, but it was much more severe, so WannaCry uh, depending on which news report you believe or, or, or subscribe to, um, they say that it, it had about a $4 billion to $8 billion impact uh, worldwide. Um, but not Petya, just within that three-hour time frame, about $10 billion of impact on, on uh, commercial organizations and, and others. So much more severe. The second thing, which again was something that, that the Crane had mentioned, was uh, the idea of backups. <clears throat> so the problem was... Um, most organizations take backups and plan for those backups to be used if a server goes down or two servers go down or ten servers go down. But the problem is if all of your servers go down, including the backup server, then what's your story? If your backups have been encrypted, then what do you do? So we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And actually. Uh, what they ended up doing was, was having to go to uh, off-site backups, uh, taking those tapes, rebuilding entire servers from uh, just the bare metal, using printed documentation if it even existed, uh, because how often do people update their, their, their printed documentation? Honestly, not very much. So um, it was a very challenging, challenging situation. Actually, uh, funny aside, well, not funny, for goodness sake, uh, but uh, Maersk, um, if any of you, did, did you have a chance to read the, huh? It was almost Snickernet to get their stuff back. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, did any of you have a chance to read the Wired.com article about NotPetya? If you get a chance, it is a fascinating read. So just look up Wired.com, NotPetya. Um, what actually ended up happening with Maersk, Maersk is, is a big global shipping company, and they were just absolutely devastated by, by uh, NotPetya. Uh, so something like 70,000 machines were just flattened. And so they're scrambling around trying to figure out how do we recover, how do we recover? And they're looking at their domain controllers. All their domain controllers are down except for one. So they, they, they said, what, what's going on here? So they figured out that this one domain controller was sitting in Ghana, in Africa, and it had had a power failure the day before, and so it couldn't get back on the network. So this one server sitting in Africa 
was the key to them restoring their entire global operation. So they had the, 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 the guy that was the IT admin there in Ghana, uh, they said, you've got to get this server back up to us. You know, get on a plane as fast as you can. We don't care what it costs. Just get this thing up to us in, in uh, Norway or wherever it was they were. Um, the guy said, I don't have a visa. I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> so they said, what do you have a visa to get to? Um, so he said, well, I can go to Nigeria. Okay, go to Nigeria and we'll meet you in Nigeria. So they met him in Nigeria and, and this guy, you know, his hands shaking, hands over the disk that is, is literally all that the company has left of their network. Um, and they were able to, to start the process of rebuilding uh, with that one, one hard drive. So uh, pretty scary stuff. This was another uh, challenge. So. Uh, Microsoft obviously wants everybody to, to be in the cloud and wants you to use Azure, wants you to use Office 365 and blah, blah, blah. The problem was, um, in many of the larger organizations, Office 365 was still functional, but if you have Active Directory Federation services configured, or if you're doing Active Directory Sync to, or, or AD Connect, I should say, if you're doing that, and the servers that perform those functions get encrypted, then you're out of luck, right? Uh, your, your ADFS servers are basically allowing you to authenticate against your domain controllers on premise rather than in, in the cloud. Now there's ways around it. You, you, can, you can change the authentication mechanism, but for the time being, they were stuck. And so we saw global organizations using text messaging, WhatsApp, Twitter, uh, to communicate with each other to, to get their recovery process started. It was a very, very tumultuous time for most people. Um, so um, there were some, some pockets of, of things where uh, things went well, um, particularly like with Boeing, right? So, so, so Boeing, um, when they were hit, um, it was a few machines that were still running Windows 7, but by and large, Boeing was running Windows 10 they had secure boot set up. They had all the, 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 the security bells and whistles going. Uh, they probably didn't know about your, your compromise, but uh, that wasn't being exploited at that time. Um, and then the, the, the network isolation bit. <clears throat> so if you think about it, under what circumstances does Bob's computer sitting here need to talk to Sally's computer over here? Just a regular client-to-client -client communication. How often does that actually happen? Should it happen? It shouldn't, right? Now you can say, oh, well, what about Skype? What about Skype? No, no, or, or, or some, some kind of instant messaging. That's that's peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay, great. That's peer-to-peer. -peer. Use IP set. Use some kind of firewall rule that, that, that allows that communication, but doesn't allow anything else, because that that ability to hop from machine to machine to machine is what allowed this thing to move so quickly. And this is what we're describing here. Uh, use multi-channel propagation. So um, even in some of the, the, the organizations where they had 97% of the machines patched against the Eternal Blue exploit, they still were devastated because they were using the same admin password and username on all these machines. So you could be patched across most of your machines, and if one of them was vulnerable, then that machine could get compromised, and then from there, the, um, uh, the, the credential theft happened. And it didn't even matter if you were patched at that point. Yes, sir? That's why a lot of colleges, when you, if you need to like access, so if you need to have a VPN for remote access, as they require you to confirm that your computer is free of viruses. Yep, yep, definitely important. Yep. Um, so it requires identity defenses as well as things like patching. Um, credential theft mitigations also affect uh, the, the targeted attacks. So um, I'll talk about uh, a couple of the, the mitigations that Microsoft has available to you. I'll tell you why uh, some of them don't work and uh, why, why some of them do. Okay, so how do you defend a Microsoft network? Um, this is uh, your adversary's business model. If the value of the data is greater than the cost to breach, then you're a target. Otherwise, they're going to target somewhere else. Now, if you're talking about, like, not Petya, if a, if a country is going against an adversary country, money is probably not even an object. 
So it's not a business model at that point. It's a, it, it's a, uh, I don't even know what. <laughs> it's just a, a political model. But, but by and large, if you're dealing with a, 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 a financial crime or, or, or some sort of uh, uh, attempt to, to compromise you from a financial standpoint, uh, this model holds true. If it, if it costs too much to attack you, then they'll move on to someone else. So there's a three-part strategy to this uh, uh, protection. There's the idea of blocking the attacks at the front line. We'll talk about that. Uh, the defense is once the, the, the attackers uh, have compromised somebody on your network, or a machine on your network, how do you contain them? And then if things all go uh, badly, what's your, what's your break glass solution? So let's take a look at the, um, the idea of raising the attacker cost to compromise your entry points. <clears throat> you know what, I forgot, I, I, I meant to do this at the beginning. Um, under, so during the lunch, I put um, an Amazon gift card under a couple of the chairs here. I taped it to the bottom. So if you want to check and see, it, it, it should be like a blue envelope. Okay, and that's why phishing works. I was going to say, oh, God, boy, huh? he wasn't here for lunch. That's why phishing works. So, <laughs> so mail and application Can content I, protections is important. Yes, sir. I, um, so I actually came from like, the sea freight industry. Um, from what? The sea freight industry. Okay. And I actually had someone on LinkedIn who reached out to me this past week uh -huh. who wanted to like ask me specific questions about that industry uh -huh. for like an Amazon gift card, and I didn't end up actually doing it, because I had no idea who this person was, and they had just a general yeah. LinkedIn profile with no personalized mm -hmm. information, so I, I, in the back of my mind, I was thinking fishing tips, that's really funny, that full circle right there. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll actually show you something in just a second uh, that, that kind of ties in directly with what you're talking about there. Uh, so, so we have to have protections on our mail systems to prevent phishing. Uh, to prevent spam from coming in. Uh, you have, um, uh, what was the name of the company out here? Fish? Fish spam. Fish what was it? Fish, Fish juice labs. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so they're outside. Um, but uh, within Office 365, there's also uh, what we call the, 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 the attack simulator. I don't know if any of you guys have, have seen the attack simulator, but I'll show it to you in a second. Um, obviously, apply security updates. Um, user education, yeah, I, I, I know. It's, it, Hard. Most people don't listen, they don't learn, they don't remember, um, but it's, it's still part of uh, the, the process. I couldn't get my VSAT speaking because 365 would block VSAT after Oh, is that right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, on the internet server side, uh, again, update uh, your, your OS and your applications. Um, oh, actually, going back to the, the application piece. And, and the mail piece. Let, let me just tell you a story about what happened within Microsoft. So um, let me show you the, the attack simulator first, and then we'll, we'll get into the other. So how many of you are using Office 365? Okay. So in Office 365, uh, depending on the licensing that you've got, you've got this uh, thing called the attack simulator. So within the attack simulator, there, there's a couple things that you can do. You can do spear phishing. Um, where you can send emails to whoever you want within your organization. There's a brute force password attack and a password spray attack. So um, any guesses what the common uh, uh, password, complex password, meaning capital, lowercase, numbers, um, and, and special character, uh, what the most popular one was early this year? Hmm? All right, so that's probably going to get caught by Office 365. They're going to say, no, that, 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 that's not good enough. Okay. Any guesses? I mean, we all know fall 2018, oh. right? So who, who won the Super Bowl? Yeah, I was going to say. The, 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 so the Eagles 2018, exclamation yeah. point. You can guarantee that that was, uh, that that was a popular one. <laughs> so, so, so within Microsoft, they, they they didn't have the nice GUI on it, but, but, but our red team that attacks Microsoft constantly, uh, they ran the, the original version of this tool back when Seattle, when the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. And so they, they, they ran it and checked for Seattle 
whatever year it was, 2015 or something like that. And they got a whole bunch of Microsoft people with that password, right? Um, now, the other thing that was pretty cool, let me show you how, how this tool works. Um, so, so, so what you could do with this tool is um, uh, figure out what are some of the common passwords that you anticipate your users would use. Fall 2018, winter 2018, stuff like that. Any of your favorite March, April 2020? Yeah, I mean, whatever your local football team is or basketball team or whatever people care about, right? Run the attack and it'll tell you these, these people are subject to this kind of attack. Um, so going to the phishing tool. So uh, what we can do here, so, so there's two ways this can be run. One way is roll your own, and then there's another one where you can do a template. So with a template, there's two options. You've got one where there's a prize giveaway, it's kind of cheesy, um, just says, you know, you want a prize, click here to select your prize. Kind of dumb. But the payroll update's actually pretty nice. They, they, they gave some uh, nice graphics and it looks official and blah, blah, blah. But what we're gonna do is run a uh, customized one. LinkedIn, out of uh, respect for you there. So I'm gonna run it against uh, the administrator account just because I've, I'm logged in as him. Now, um, what's interesting about this is that if you use some other tools, um, they're gonna be sending the email as if it's an external sender, right? And so a lot of users are kind of uh, aware of that, that threat, and so they're not gonna click on things. But because you're running this within Office 365, you can make it appear like you're running it as, you know, Satya Nadella or whoever, right, on, 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 the, on the network. And you won't, hurt, you won't get grabbed by the junk email filters like some of them. And, and because you're running it internally, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it as this guy, Araf Sherazai. So he's, he's one of the users in my uh, Office 365. That's the email address that he has. Now, um, one of the things that's listed here is a phishing URL. So Microsoft maintains a list of phishing URLs. They're, they're safe. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just uh, there. Uh, as, as kind of placeholders. So I'm going to use payrolltooling.net and then I'm going to use um, me over here. So I took this LinkedIn um, uh, email from my own email and what I'm going to do is simulate uh, somebody sending this myself. And notice what I've done here, I mean, maybe you can't read that, but I've changed this URL so that it actually goes to that uh, phishing URL. <clears throat> so I'll right click on it and do copy, paste it in here. Doesn't look perfect, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the point, right? So, so, so if, you, if you take a step back and think about what we're trying to do here, the idea is to train your users. If you make it look exactly like it's coming from HR, or exactly like it's coming from someone, and somebody clicks on it, can you blame them, right? So, so, so you wanna give them some kind of a tell, something that, that, that will indicate to them there's something wrong here, and that will train them. So in this one, maybe what I'll do is um, I'll make the date too far ahead, okay? So I'll send it. <clears throat> So now what it's going to do is going to send an email to uh, that user, uh, the, the, the administrator account. And what it's going to look like is that it came directly from RF. And flick back and forth here. All right, should be there. Come on. So when, we, when, when the red team ran this at Microsoft, the way that they did it was um, they, they, they crafted a nice little email, and this was before Xbox One came out. And they, 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 they put a picture of the new Xbox One up in the, the, the header of the email, not the header of the email, but the, the, the top of the email. 
and they said, want to be the first one on your, on, on your block to own an Xbox One, uh, register here for uh, you know, the opportunity to be a beta tester of Xbox One, boom, click it. And take a guess how many people they got at Microsoft. <laughs> Thousands. All right, so now the email came in. It looks for all the world like it came from somebody on my internal network. The email looks good. Oh, well, it doesn't really. It didn't uh, translate very well. Yeah, but I don't have the, the link to click on. Uh, anyway. In any case, if, if, if it had been formatted correctly, I would have had that, that link uh, in, in the thing that said view message. I'd click on it. It would send me to a page that said, you know, you've been fished. Go directly to HR for remedial training or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's what the, uh, the attack simulator is for. <clears throat> okay. Going back here. <clears throat> so we did all that. Um, operational hygiene, hygiene um, restricting exposure of privileged access from endpoints, changing default passwords, applying security configurations. Um, so one of the big, big problems is uh, people using default passwords, uh, whether you're talking about on network devices or on Windows or other um, operating systems. All right, so once, uh, if we assume breach, right, that's, that's the position that Microsoft itself takes, is we assume somebody bad is on our network. Now, how do, we, how do we limit their exposure to um, um, the, the rest of the network? So one of the big things uh, that, that, that an organization can do is remove the excessive permissions on file shares, on SharePoint. Instead of using full control and modify uh, and giving it to everyone or all authenticated users or domain users, Try to shrink it down to people that actually need access to these things so that um, uh, attacks are, are more limited in scope. Securing privilege access. So have any of you looked at the securing privilege access roadmap, the SPA roadmap? It's a great uh, bunch of, of, uh, of guidance for, for the higher privilege, um, uh, the, the management of higher privilege uh, things like workstations. So, this is a very important concept, pause. So what we're talking about there is privileged access workstations. What we mean is if, if a machine is controlling access to a high value target, you need to lock down that machine, as well as the target, right, obviously. Um, so within Microsoft, um, for managing Azure and Office 365 and Hotmail and Xbox and whatever, we have something like 17,000 machines that are dedicated only to contacting a specific service. That's all they do. They don't have internet access. They don't have, you know, they, they can't get their email on it. It's locked down. They have IPsec rules that say you can only get to this service. That's, that's an important concept. Now, it's not, um, it's not cheap, right? It's not cheap to do it that way, but if Microsoft could do it cheaper and still remain secure, we would. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the, the, the best way that we've found to, to maintain security. Randomizing local admin passwords. Okay, so, so I mentioned um, tools that Microsoft has that are good and some that are, are not so good. There's a tool called um, LAPS, Local Admin Password uh, Solution. It's free from Microsoft, um, and the, the idea behind it is that you can randomize your, your user, uh, user passwords on workstations and the workstation passwords themselves. The problems with LAPS, number one, requires a, a schema extension. So sometimes people get a little edgy about that kind of thing. Um, you can only um, uh, change passwords on domain joined machines. So if you've got machines that are standalone machines, you can't use LAPS against them. Um, it can only change the passwords on two accounts on each machine. So if you have multiple admin or service accounts that you need to randomize the passwords, uh, you can only do two of them. So there's a, there's a couple different uh, reasons why that's not necessarily the best solution. It's better than nothing, 
but it's not necessarily the best solution. So at the end of the deck, what I've got is a link to a um, uh, the guy that, that does the, the, the SANS uh, Windows uh, security um, class. Um, he has a better solution than LAPS that uses certificate-based communication. It doesn't matter how many machines you're using. It doesn't matter if you're joined to the domain. It's a pretty pretty nice uh, nice solution. And it doesn't cost anything either if it's in a public domain. Um, so that's, that's stage one to secure your, your machines. The next stage, two and three, are just enough admin and just in time admin. Multi-factor authentication, using RBAC, using things like shielded VMs or uh, admin force, using smart cards. Those are things that are gonna take a little more time, a little more training, but they're things that are going to secure your um, environment uh, much more uh, effectively. So this kind of is illustrating the point that I was making. If you've got a workstation here, if this object controls this set of servers, then object B is a dependent, or it depends upon the security of object A. In other words, if I can compromise this machine, I can probably steal the credentials off of it and access something over here. Um, just take a look at this when you get a chance. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about how this actually works but this is based on, on how Microsoft uh, envisions uh, a, a secure network uh, being protected. Okay, last resort. <clears throat> so if we assume all defenses fail, how do you protect your, um, or how, how do you recover? So um, obviously you have to protect all your business critical data, which means you have to know what data is critical. Um, you have to validate your backups. So funny story. I was talking with a, a customer, um, this was in London, and uh, they had been doing, the, they had data centers on, on either side of, of, of the city. So they would run backups in, in this site, and then uh, that evening, somebody from the IT department would get on the tube, go over to the other data center, hand off the tapes. Did that every night for years and years. Um, one day they had, um, you know, a, a server was lost or whatever, it, 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 it was uh, dropped. And so uh, they had to recover from backup. So they sent the guy back over, got the tapes, brought it back over. They looked at it, empty. The tape was just blank. They're like, that's kind of odd. Let's go back and get another tape. Same thing, blank. And they started to panic a little bit. So they started going back months and months. They kept coming back with blank tapes. They're like, what is happening here? All our tapes are blank. They finally figured out that what was happening was that when he got on the tube, the tube is has gigantic magnets. <laughs> <laughs> and it was wiping the tapes as they were traveling back and forth. So validating your backups is pretty important. You know, don't don't wait until a disaster comes uh, to to test your backups. Also don't bring your own magnets. Very exactly, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, backups have to be inaccessible to the attacker. So either your backups need to be offline, stored in some facility where that, that, that backup cannot be uh, encrypted or attacked or whatever, or potentially store your backup in a cloud service. Now, we would love you to store it in Azure, but if you store it in AWS, that's fine. The point is, have some way of recovering from um, an online service. Uh, and that's what this is talking about. <clears throat> okay, um, as I mentioned before, part of this has to do with uh, understanding your data. So, so understanding what's critical on your network is important. So that means understanding, you know, is it financial transactions? Is it personally sensitive data? Is it some sort of technology? You know, uh, I would call it uh, information that you own. No, not uh, intellectual property or something. Intellectual property, that's it. I knew there was a P and an I in there. Yeah. Um, so understand where those are and, and how to protect them. Uh, make sure you do things like uh, audit and alert on backup failure, and then ensure that hardware is available for restore in the event of a complete equipment failure. So uh, like with, with Maersk, they had all the backups, but their hardware was just, there, there, there was nothing on it that was useful. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's that. Uh, what's my timing look like right now? All right, maybe I can get this done quickly. So how many of you have been to a, a SANS course? So anybody go to SEC 501? You went to it? Okay, so you'll recognize this. So, so the idea here is that I've got a Windows 10 machine and I'm gonna infect it with ransomware. So uh, this is a fairly um, stupid piece of ransomware. It's called Jigsaw, but it'll be fun. So I'm gonna run it. It says, congratulations, your software has been registered. Because congratulations always goes right along with the red X, right? Um, it says, email us this code and uh, you know, we'll, we'll activate your software. So what's gonna happen here is it's gonna pop up with this goofy looking guy and he's gonna type forever, um, trying to make it look ominous. Um, but the idea that, that I'm gonna try to do here, and, and hopefully it'll work in, in real time, is uh, try to identify what the, the, the ransomware is trying to do and intercept the traffic and fool the ransomware into um, believing that it's been paid. So here's the ransomware. It's running in real time. And, and then the traditional, oh, that's my host. Uh, so, you know, traditionally the misspellings and the bad grammar, so you know it's a real yeah, ransomware. It's like <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. 150 US dollars in Bitcoin. Um, and they, at some point, says, like, uh, send me half a Bitcoin or something like that, which is far more than 150 dollars. <laughs> oh, I've got a hard drive for real on it somewhere. This is all in my basement, but I don't know where it is. Dang it. So you remember this? Yeah, I do. So. Yeah. <laughs> so he gives you nice instructions on how to get Bitcoin. There it is, purchased $150 with the Bitcoin. I don't know why he didn't just put the words up there. Why is this dramatically doing the same? It's Jigsaw. Hmm? It's Jigsaw. Jigsaw. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so within two minutes of receiving it, we're going to fix everything. I'm going to spend all my time waiting for this guy to finish typing. <laughs> this is great. Try anything funny. <laughs> and the computer has several safety measures to delete the files. And then a, uh, a timer will start here in a second. <clears throat> so again, the idea is we're going to try to trick the ransomware into believing that it's been paid. Okay, I got 59 minutes and 58 seconds. Let's see if I can get it done in five. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to try to do is just say I made a payment. Okay, it says, nope, you didn't. If I look here, though, it says the remote name couldn't be resolved. btc.blocker.io. Okay, so, um, so how can I make it believe that I own btcblocker.io? What file can I change? Your host file. So I've got this Kali Linux machine over here. Whoops. So my Kali Linux machine is running 10, it's uh, IP address is 10, 10, 10, 4. So what I'm going to do over here is change my host file. So I'm going to make a copy of it. And back it up. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to change 10.10.10.4 to btc.blocker.io. Oops. I am. So now, effectively, I'm telling the machine, if you want to get to the Bitcoin site, go to my Kali Linux box. Okay, now I take this and dump it in here. Okay, so I'm going to try again. 
Okay, now it says something different. Now it says no connection could be made because the target machine actively refused it. 10, 10, 10, 4, port 80. So what's it looking for? What's on port 80? Web server, right? It's looking for a web server. Okay, let's give it a web server. And simple HTTP server port 80. Okay, now my Kali Linux server is uh, a web server. All right, let's see if it likes it now. Oh, different. So you didn't send me enough. Okay. So, what does that mean? So over here we see the path it's trying to get to, right? It's trying to get to this, this uh, API, V1 coin, blah, 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 blah. So if you, if you went down that path, you would find the HTML page where the, the, the Bitcoin is, is uh, registered and, and paid. So I've already done that. I, I've already captured that on, on this, uh, uh, this machine just to save time. But what I'm going to do now is say, okay, what I want to do is use burp suite, oh, come on, right? Let's see if this will work. <clears throat> Doggone it. Um, let's see. <laughs> Why is this not working? just failing. Doggone it. All right, so the, the point was, if you use Burp Suite, what, what it actually does is it serves as a proxy. So your machine actually, um, any, any traffic that you send out will um, be caught by Burp Suite before it leaves your, your network adapter, and then you can um, capture the response. So it sends it out, sends a response back, you can look at the response and take an action on it. What it does when, when, when it's working correctly is um, it'll send a response that says, this is how much Bitcoin the person has paid. And you can edit it right there in real time, change it to say, I, I'm going to pay you $50 million in Bitcoin, send it out, and the guy will say, thank you very much, and he'll decrypt all your files. Sorry it didn't work. That sucks. But it actually does work most of the time. I'm not sure why this isn't working. Uh, but for now, uh, I'm just uh, I'm dead in the water, so... Thank goodness for VMware. Back to phase one. Um, I can try to, if you guys want to stick around and wait for a few more minutes, I, I, I'll try it again and see if it'll work. Um, but that was all I had. Uh, there are, these are the resources. Um, this is the, uh, the, the SANS reference I was talking about, the uh, changing your password, your local admin password across your enterprise. Um, let's see if we can get this thing broken. Do, 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 do. that. Now I'm going to skip ahead and do the host file stuff just so that we're saving time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just doing the same stuff that I did before. And since I've already got the web server and everything running on the other machine, I don't have to walk through that.
Haha. Okay. So uh, I need to change my proxy settings so that uh, I'm using myself as a proxy server. Okay. Then I just got to wait for this thing to finish up. No, I, I went, I, I reverted to the uh, clean state of oh. VMware. So it's, I went back to a snapshot. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, it was funny though, when I was playing around with it before, um, when it started up, just as it was starting up, if I hit Control Alt and I don't remember, some, some, something else that I hit, uh, the, the malware went away. Well, that was easy. That's on Microsoft. <laughs> Sorry. No. All right. So again. I, I quick question. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit new to the security realm here. So ransomware, I've kind of seen that like pop up my phone. So basically, how am I enabling it? Is someone sending me a link or is someone encrypting a link yeah. within something that I'm opening, which then triggers Both. this to activate and then hit me as a user? Is that how that's yeah. working, yeah. essentially? So typically it's a link that performs some action against your machine. Okay, okay so uh, this is going. Um, I made a payment. Uh, let me get this started over here. And I'm just doing the defaults. Okay, so what I want to do is proxy, look at the proxy. And hopefully this will work. So I say, I made a payment, now give me back my files. So it tells me this is what's going out, it's going to bpc.blocker.io, which again is my Kali Linux machine. I'm gonna say, for the action, intercept, and give me the response to this request, and forward. Okay, so this gives me what the HTML on the, the target is, right? So this is all the stuff on the back end that's checking to see uh, what I'm up to. Okay, then I forward, and I want to intercept the response again. Okay, now, if you notice here, it gives me a status, success, address, 15TBY. Uh, maybe that's a different one. Anyway, uh, it tells me what the balance is. Balance is 0 0.002. Okay, so I'm going to change that. We'll give them 10,000 Bitcoin. And then, great job, I'm decrypting your files. And it goes away. Allegedly, it'll go away. Oh, oh, oh also, it calls itself Firefox. It, it, it uses that name as Firefox, as the process it's running. So that's, that's what will die here. All right. Any questions? It's fun stuff. <laughs>